following is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. Okay, so what I want to do now is to introduce our speaker, who is uh, Dwight Hughes, of course. And, and when I read his bio, I said, man, this is really long, but I was so impressed, I couldn't figure out very much to leave out because it's a very impressive bio. Um, so uh, let me begin. So Dwight Hughes is a public uh, historian, author, and speaker about the C Civil War naval history. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1967 with a major in history and government. He served 20 years as a Navy surface warfare officer on most of the world's oceans in ships ranging from destroyers to aircraft carriers and with river forces in Vietnam, uh, where he has a bronze star for meritorious service and a Purple Heart. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Hughes taught Naval ROTC at the University of Rochester, earning an MA in political science. He later earned an MS in information systems management from USC. In his final seat tour, uh, Hughes planned and conducted convoy exercises with over 20 ships of the maritime preposition force Diego Garcia Indian Ocean. Now, of course, if that's not enough, he had a second career involving software engineering, primarily in geographic feature uh, naming and electronic mapping under contract for the U.S. Geological Survey. A ridge in Antarctica is actually named after him in recognition of his contributions to Antarctic databases uh, and information uh, services. He, of course, has been a frequent speaker now in uh, Civil War roundtables and to other Civil War groups. And uh, we'll give him a plug aside from his upcoming book on the Monitor. He has authored a Confederate biography, The Cruise of the USS Shenandoah. Uh, and he's a contributing author on the Emerging Civil War blog where I have read his contributions. Uh, his book will be published in spring of 2021. Uh, he lives nearby in Manassas with his wife, uh, Judy, a former Air Force officer and electronics communications engineer. So you can see why they want to leave out most of that stuff. At any rate, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dwight Hughes. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Uh, this is quite a group. Okay, uh, before I get started, I'd put in, like to put in a plug for our blog site, theemergingcivilwar.com. Uh, lots of really good uh, information in there. We uh, a wonderful group of public historians contribute to that blog regularly. Uh, you can sign up and get our monthly newsletter if you're interested. Or uh, if you'd like to send me your email, I'll, I'll sign up for you. Uh, this is the, the book that's coming out. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to say that it's now at the printer. And uh, we hope to have it out by the anniversary uh, in early March. Um, and this is part of the Emerging Civil War series, uh, which is uh, a wonderful series, award-winning series of, of battle and campaign studies in a short uh, public history format, lots of pictures, uh, wonderful overviews of all the campaigns and battles. And this is the first uh, dedicated naval volume in the Emerging Civil War series. Uh, these are, these are softbound copies, inexpensive, and uh, are wonderful uh, introductions. Uh, if you don't know the story, or even if you do know the story, you, you can learn a lot from them. So uh, let's get started here. <clears throat> uh, Saturday, March 8th, 1862, in the afternoon, the revolutionary, not to say bizarre, ironclad, the USS Monitor, entered Chesapeake Bay. She had rushed down from New York through gale force winds, almost sinking in the process. 
Monitor's mission was to defeat the powerful Confederate ironclad ram, the CSS Virginia, before she destroyed the wooden warships of the Union fleet in Hampton Roads. Monitor was a steam propelled iron plated raft with a cylindrical iron gun turret and two 11 inch Dahlgren smoothbores. The flat expanse of deck was barely a foot and a half above the surface of the water. 14 officers and 57 crewmen were encased in the hull below the waterline. Captain John L. Warden ordered an exhausted and dispirited crew to strip the vessel of her sea rig and make every preparation for battle. To mid 19th century mariners, this enclosed cramped artificial space, which resembled future submarines, was a radical departure from sailing and fighting on open decks and in the high rigging of a traditional man of war. And not a little frightening, Monitor redefined the relationship between men and machines in war, challenging ancient concepts of honor and valor. These developments paralleled the transformative combat experience of soldiers who began the conflict standing up in open fields, manfully confronting the enemy face to face, but ended up burrowing into trenches and crouching behind elaborate fortifications technology had advanced the defense over the offense. Paymaster William Keeler commented to his wife, you may rest assured your better half will be in no more danger from rebel compliments than if he was seated with you at home. There isn't danger enough to give us any glory. Not a man is exposed to action. Our boilers and our entire machinery are completely and effectually protected. Monitor would become a cultural icon of American industrial strength and ingenuity in advertisements for everything from whiskey to refrigerators. She embodied social and institutional as well as industrial revolutions. <clears throat> but this would be a largely symbolic role, which would far outshine her actual accomplishments beyond a single engagement in a specific set of circumstances. After the battle, the Union caught monitor fever. 50 monitors would be built in a bewildering range of one, two, and three turret classes. <clears throat> but as a warship type, they were not up to the hype and proved to be of limited utility. With their low profile, monitors were not seagoing vessels and were not effective against shore fortifications, although they did neutralize several Confederate ironclads. The most important technical innovation was the rotating armored turret, which would evolve into 20th century battleships. But during Monitor's construction, public opinion had a decidedly ambivalent, was decidedly ambivalent concerning the strained watercraft. The technological transition in one generation from timeless horse-drawn transportation to huge locomotives had been breathtaking. On the water, the tall warships had always inspired awe, but so far they looked much the same, even when driven by steam as well as sail. It was not clear where a little monitor fit in this revolution. Was she even a ship or just a small ironclad two-gun battery? Many could not conceive that a slab of iron would float. One Vermont reporter could hardly find words. Monitor is, in fact, unlike anything that ever floated on Neptune's bosom. The impression at a short distance is that of insignificance and harmlessness. But on standing upon its deck and looking upon it more closely, the impression is that of great power and invulnerability. The description of the Leviathan of scriptures very adequately expresses the feeling which this sea monster excites. The vessel had a most singular appearance, wrote Chief Engineer Alvin C. Stimmers. From a half mile distance, she appeared to be sinking. The hull was not visible, while the turret seemed to sit upon the water by itself. People said she looked like a washtub on a raft, 
a cheese box on a plank, a hat on a shingle, et cetera, et cetera. Nathaniel Hawthorne would write, it looked like a gigantic rat trap. It was ugly, questionable, suspicious, evidently mischievous. Nay, I will allow myself to call it devilish. Monitor Captain John L. Warden recalled, here was an unknown, untried vessel with all but a small portion below the waterline for crew to live with the ocean beating over their heads. An iron coffin-like ship of which the gloomiest predictions were made with her crew shut out from sunlight and the air above the sea, depending entirely on artificial means to supply the air they breathe. A failure of the machinery would be almost certain death to her men. Monitor proceeded across Chesapeake Bay as evening descended on that Saturday. They heard heavy guns in the distance. Plumes of smoke hung over the land. Little black spots sprang into the air, paused for a moment and expanded into large white clouds. Gun flashes lit the darkening horizon bursting shells flashed in the air. The pilot informed them that this dreaded Virginia was raking havoc in Hampton Roads. The USS Cumberland was sunk and the USS Congress, the USS Congress was ablaze. Numerous vessels were fleeing, quote, like a covey of frightened quails. <clears throat> Their lights danced over the water in all directions. The steam frigate USS Minnesota the most powerful ship the Navy could deploy, had run hard aground off Newport News earlier in the day while pursuing the marauding Virginia. The rebel ironclad surely would return in the morning to complete her destruction. Warden was ordered to take monitor to defend Minnesota. An atmosphere of gloom pervaded the fleet, recalled Lieutenant Samuel Green. The pygmy aspect of the newcomer did not inspire confidence among those who had witnessed the destruction of the day before. The USS Congress blazed like a gigantic torch stuck in the mud where she had been pulverized by Virginia. Around 2 a.m. that morning, she blew up. Certainly a grander sight was never seen, wrote Lieutenant Green, but it went straight to the marrow of our bones. Near us too, at the bottom of the river, lay the USS Cumberland with her silent crew of brave men who died while fighting their guns to the water's edge. The USS Monitor entered Hampton Roads, cleared for action and anchored near the Minnesota. Her journey to this point had been as unprecedented as the impending battle. Let us step back a bit and look at her origins. New developments in naval armaments, larger guns, explosive shells, rifle bores, had rendered wooden warships increasingly vulnerable, while significant improvements in iron armor had been made, as had been demonstrated in the recent Crimean War. A furious ironclad arms race was on in Europe. The French launched the first ironclad battleship, the Galois, in November 1859. In 1860, the British produced the magnificent HMS Warrior, the first fully iron-hulled warship and the most advanced, most powerful in the world. The US Navy had been in the forefront of developments in steam propulsion and naval armaments. In the 1840s and 50s, the Navy ceased building sail-only warships altogether while developing advanced wooden steam cruisers culminating in the powerful Merrimack frigate class. These powerful warships were equal or superior to conventional European frigates. But America had no far-flung empire to defend and no neighboring threats. The United States naval strategy focused on harbor and coastal defense with swift cruisers like Merrimack to protect commerce in distant waters. 
Americans were content to allow Europeans to pursue costly experiments in the unproven technology of iron armor. But secession and blockade altered the strategic picture dramatically. Europe, particularly Great Britain and France, suffered shortages of cotton, disruptions in industry, trade and finance, high unemployment, social and political unrest. Great Britain seriously considered intervening on behalf of the Confederacy, perhaps forcefully. British support for rebel commerce raiding and blockade running enraged the United States. Arguments over the roles and responsibilities of neutral countries in wartime harken back to 1812 and the revolution. The specter of a third war with Great Britain, the world's most powerful nation, now armed with sea-going ironclads, became real and immediate. In the summer of 1861, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells struggled with the notion of ironclad vessels. It was a subject, quote, full of difficulty and doubt, he told Congress. England and France had built large, powerful sea-going ironclads. The United States had none. <clears throat> it was evident that a new and material element in maritime warfare was developing itself and demanded immediate attention. Iowa Senator James Grimes supported the development of ironclad. We need more effective blockade, he wrote. Scoundrels north as well as scoundrels south are carrying on an unlawful trade in fraud of our revenue. Pirates and sea rovers must be captured. Southern harbors and forts must be retaken. Commerce must be protected and northern harbors defended. Suppose England, in her love for cotton, should attempt to break our blockade, and we should get into trouble with her, what is to become of our northern cities and our cities upon the coast. He wished to protect his country and preserve it in all its parts. Secretary Wells was overseeing an immense, unprecedented warship procurement and building program while instigating a nearly impossible continent-wide blockade. He concluded that it would not be advisable in the current crisis to commit heavy expenditures, quote, by way of experiment on unproven technology in ironclads. He recommended appointment of a, quote, proper and competent board to inquire into and report on the subject before Congress considered larger appropriations for operational vessels. But the most immediate threats were Confederate ironclads under construction in Norfolk, Mobile, and New Orleans, particularly the former USS Merrimack, now the CSS Virginia. The Mobile Register boasted that the new weapon, quote, would be a floating fortress that would be able to defeat the whole Navy of the United States and bombard its city with their great size, strength, powerful engines, and invulnerable iron casing, she would easily destroy or disperse the blockading fleet. She could throw bombs into Fort Monroe. We hope, we hope, to soon, we hope soon to hear that she is ready to commence her avenging career on the seas. Northern public opinion was aroused also the Philadelphia Examiner thought it curious that the United States should be behind the age. We intend to have, an, if we intend to have a naval force worthy of our power and pretensions, we shall have to build iron case vessels as France and England have done and are doing. Congress directed Secretary Wells to appoint an ironclad board to investigate plans and specifications for constructing, quote, iron or steel clad steamships or steam batteries, appropriating for that purpose $1.5 million. Wells selected three senior line officers, two Commodores, crusty old salts of the wood and canvas Navy, veterans of the War of 1812, and one commander. 
the board advertised for proposals and from them recommended three designs to be produced simultaneously. The first two were conventional wooden hulls with iron cladding, broadside battery, steam propeller, and a sailing rig. They would become the USS New Ironsides and the USS Galena. The final board selection was proposed by Sweetie's engineer, John Erickson. The intense stocky Erickson, born in 1803, had a long career in Sweden, England, and America, designing, building, and improving steam engines. He produced a host of inventions, including the shipboard steam condenser, and collected numerous patents. Erickson's proposal possessed, recalled Secretary Wells, extraordinary and valuable features for coast and river blockade. It involved a revolution in naval warfare. President Lincoln remarked, all I have to say is what the girl said when she put her foot into the stocking. It strikes me there's something in it. Erickson's low profile concept was inspired by Swedish lumber rafts. He never claimed to have invented the revolving armored turret. The idea had been circulating among engineers for decades, but he was the first to successfully deploy it. The ironclad board had serious reservations, but reluctantly agreed to proceed. The plan addressed the critical requirement, a combat ready craft suitable for restricted waters to be rapidly constructed and deployed. In its favor were presumed invulnerability, small size, shallow draft, and limited exposed target area. Worrisome unknowns included over-reliance on steam power, semi-submerged hull, questionable stability, and untried turret-mounted armament. Other problems included uncomfortable living conditions, limited seaworthiness, and very restricted space to operate and maintain the guns and machinery. The contract was signed on October 4th, 1861 for an ironclad shot-proof steam battery. John Erickson and his backers were to deliver the vessel complete and ready for service with the unprecedented, within the unprecedented span of 100 days for a price of $275,000. Erickson lit the fuse on a frenetic and incredibly complex manufacturing process using civilian facilities because Navy shipyards had no capabilities to produce ironclads. He orchestrated a conglomerate of nine contractors and multiple subcontractors working simultaneously in at least seven Northeast cities to produce raw materials, angle iron, bar iron, plate iron, rivets, <coughs> and finished components for assembly at the Continental Ironworks in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Most of these firms clustered around New York City and Albany, centers of steam engine and iron manufacturing. They applied methods and materials in common use for locomotives and other land products. Only Yankees could produce an experimental ironclad vessel from scratch in a hundred days. Despite the rush, Erickson did not scrimp on furnishings and gadgets. The officers' closet-sized staterooms were appointed in Victorian opulence, while the crewmen slept in hammocks on the more utilitarian berth deck behind the officers' quarters. Six-inch round glass windows or deck lights set in the deck overhead, supplemented by oil lamps, provided meager illumination. Erickson crafted a compact 400 horsepower steam engine with a single cylinder, 40 inches in diameter, driving two horizontal pistons. Auxiliary steam engines, an uncommon feature at the time, drove the turret and ventilation blowers. A steam condenser provided fresh water. The guns were mounted in customized low profile friction carriages to dampen recoil in the confined turret, confined turret. Erickson installed the first 
custom design, pressure flushing below the waterline, water closet or heads. Surgeon Daniel Logue suffered the indignity of being blown off the seat by a jet of water when he operated the flushing valves in the wrong order. Gideon Wells selected as commander, 27 year veteran, Lieutenant John L. Warden. Warden had been captured by Confederates the previ previous year while running secret dispatches to Fort Pickens in Florida, becoming the conflict's first prisoner of war. Confined in Alabama for eight months before being exchanged, Warden was still ill and weak when he assumed command. Lieutenant Samuel Dana Green was named executive officer, second in command. The 22-year-old Marylander graduated from the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis in June 1859. Green represented the young professional officer corps, educated at the new school, steeped in new technologies, and fired in the crucible of war to lead the Navy into the 20th century. With little public notice on the drizzly morning of January 30th, 1862, monitors slid down the ways into the East River before a large spontaneous crowd. The New York Tribune wrote, the assemblage cheered rapturously as the strange looking craft glided swiftly and gracefully into its new element. Nearby vessels fired salutes. Predictions that she would break her back or swamp upon launching were disproven. Because the CSS Virginia was expected to appear in Hampton Roads any day, work continued around the clock to complete fitting out. Despite futile attempts at secrecy, journalists swarmed the ship, leaving in their reporting little to the imagination. Captain Warden sought volunteers from warships in New York Harbor for the crew. He described to them the probable perils of passage and the certainty of combat. Many were enthusiastic, many more enthusiastically responded than were required. A better crew, no naval commander ever had the honor to command, Warden would write. Few of them had pre-war sea service. Most were recent recruits, recruits with little or no maritime experience. Some were European immigrants and at least two were African Americans. These volunteers endured ribbing from fellow seamen. In solemn and prophetic tone, one old salt proclaimed, you fellows certainly have got a lot of nerve or want to commit suicide, one or the other. Several volunteers took one look at Monitor and promptly deserted. After hurried and superficial testing, Monitor got underway for Hampton Roads on March 6, 1862. On the morning of Saturday, March 8th, as Monitor approached the entrance to Chesapeake Bay, the frustrated Commander-in-Chief convened a council of war to prod Major General George B. McClellan into action on his proposed campaign to capture Ridge Richmond. He planned to land at Urbana on the Rappahannock, but as General Joe Johnston fell back from Manassas, McClellan decided intent instead to invade the peninsula at Fort Monroe. Throughout that afternoon, telegrams filtered in as the former USS Merrimack, now CSS Virginia, sallied forth into Hampton Roads. The Merrimack is close at hand. The Merrimack is engaging the Cumberland at close quarters. The Congress is now burning. For a while, the news looked very badly, recalled Presidential Secretary John Hay. Secretary of War Edward M. Stanton ordered the news be made public at once to alert northern ports that they were in great danger. The next morning, Sunday, March 9th, wrote a senior treasury official, was as gloomy as any that Washington had experienced since the beginning of the war. Lincoln called an emergency session at the White House for a much alarmed cabinet. John Hay reported that panic was intense at Willard's Hotel. Nothing was too wild to be believed. Presidential Secretaries John Hay and John Nicolay 
characterized this cabinet meeting as, quote, perhaps the most excited and impressive of the whole war. Gideon Wells was asked what could be done to counter this formidable monster. The Navy secretary had no answers beyond faith in the untried monitor. She should have arrived in Hampton Roads the day before, but due to a break in the telegraph cable, they had no news of her. Wells recorded in his diary that, quote, the most frightened man was the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. <laughs> he was at times almost frantic. Stanton's words were broken and denunciatory. The panic under which he labored added to the apprehension of others. According to Wells, Stanton insisted that the rebel ironclad would change the whole character of the war. She would destroy every naval vessel and take Fortress Monroe. McClellan's campaign against Rich Richmond must be abandoned. General Burnside's forces must be recalled from the North Carolina Sound. The vital blockading base of Port Royal Sound must be given up. Virginia would come up the Potomac, disperse Congress and destroy the capital. She might go to New York and Boston and destroy those cities or hold them for ransom. The army secretary was contemptuous of the notion that a two-gun iron raft could stop her. Secretaries Nicolay and Hay wrote that Stanton, quote, walked up and down the room like a caged lion. Chase was impatient. Wells and Seward were hopeful. McClellan was dumbfounded and silent. The president was, as usual, in, quote, as usual in trying moments, composed but eagerly inquisitive, critically scanning the dispatches, interrogating the officers, joining scrap to scrap of information, applying his searching analysis and clear logic to read the danger and find the remedy. The possibilities of the hour were indeed sufficiently portentous to create consternation. Wells caustic, caustically described Stanton peering out the window with an expansive view down the Potomac, expecting a rebel shell or cannonball to land in the White House before they left the room. But Wells assured them that Virginia was so loaded down with armor that she could not venture outside Hampton Roads. She could not, quote, ascend the river and surprise us with a cannonball. Certainly she could not attack simultaneously every city and harbor on the coast. It would better become us, Wells advised, to calmly consider the situation and inspire confidence by acting, so far as we could, intelligently and with discretion and judgment. Stanton telegraphed governors in major cities in the north to man their forts and place timber rafts and other obstructions at the mouths of harbors. Preparations were made to block the Potomac. That Sunday afternoon, the chattering telegraph finally produced the lost message of the night before. Monitor had arrived and will take care of the Virginia. The president and his cabinet awaited the outcome. In Hampton Roads that morning, the USS Minnesota was still hard aground. The crew making hasty preparations to abandon ship with monitor anchored nearby. Fog lifting from the water about 8 a.m. revealed the CSS Virginia approaching. Minnesota's captain declared to monitors Captain Warden, if I cannot lighten my ship off the shoal, I shall destroy her. Warden assured him, I will stand by you to the last if I can help you. No, sir, you cannot help me, was the reply. Within the dim claustrophobic claustrophobic metal drum of Monitor's turret, 20 feet in diameter, behind, behind eight inches of iron, squatted the two immense 11-inch Dahlgren smoothbores. Lieutenant Green supervised 16 brawny sailors packed in eight to a gun. None of them had been drilled on these guns in this turret. Captain Warden took, the, took station on the pilot house platform near the bow his head and shoulders in the box, peering through the half-inch viewing slit. Jammed at his elbow was the pilot and the helmsman. The only communication between pilot house and turret was via runners between the two stations. Below the turret, recalled Paymaster Keeler, everyone was at his post, 
fixed like a statue. The most profound silence reigned. If there had been a coward heart there, its throb would have been audible. So intense was the stillness. I experienced a peculiar sensation. I do not think it was fear, but it was different from anything I ever knew before. We were enclosed in what we were supposed to be impenetrable armor. We knew that a powerful foe was about to meet us. Ours was an untried experiment and our enemy's first fire might make a coffin for us all. The suspense was awful as we waited in the dim light, expecting every moment to hear the crash of our enemy's shot. Warden charged directly for Virginia, placing a little monitor directly between Minnesota and the foe. In the gloom below, Keeler heard the muffled whump of a gun, then another and another. Virginia and Minnesota blasted away at each other at long range, skipping shells along the water surface. Rounds could take 20 to 40 skips. Several friendly rounds bounced off monitor. Wrote Keeler, the infernal howl of the shells as they flew over our vessel was all that broke the silence and made it seem still more terrible. Captain Warden closed about a third of a mile, altered course and ordered commence firing. The mammoth gun port cover rumbled open, the big black muscle protruded. Lieutenant Green yanked the firelock string at 8.45 a.m. The entire structure throbbed and trembled with a deafening concussion as the eight-ton behemoth leapt inward. The rebel ironclad turned her head upstream and replied with a broadside, followed by a volume of musketry which rattled on our iron deck like hailstones, but caused no damage. These first shots made quite a sensation on worried gunners inside the turret. Warden expected that most rebel shots against the curved exterior would glance off without damage, but he worried that a shot fired directly in line with the vertical axis of the turret could deform the structure and jam the turret to keep it revol from revolving. The captain also feared that hundreds of bolt and rivet heads holding together eight layers of one inch iron plates would blast off when hit, creating lethal projections inside the turret. In either case, monitor would be helpful. But he reported, a 150 pound projectile hit straight on from 30 yards, created a smooth dent a perfect mold of the shell two and a half inches deep. The indentation carried right through eight inches of plate without cracking or splitting the iron. To everyone's relief, enemy fire did not dislodge a single rivet head and the turret continued to revolve. One rebel shell struck the vulnerable deck edge and tore up one of the plates. Worried that the blow might open a seam below the waterline, Warden crawled out of the gun port, walked to the side, and lay down upon his chest to examine the damage while bullets zinged off the iron deck, as thick as hailstones in a storm. The hull was uninjured, except for a few splinters of wood, so he crawled back into the turret. Captain Ward announced to the crew that Virginia could not sink them. If we let her pound us for a month, the men cheered. Guns bellowed through smoking white smoke, shot with flame, round, screamed, clanged, boomed, and splashed all around. Engines thumped and clanked, blowers roared. Black clouds billowed from the sky. Big propellers thrashed the water. Men trapped inside, many stripped to the waist with scraps of cloth around their ears, shouted, sweated, and struggled to manage their metal monsters. Virginia's acting captain, Lieutenant Catesby Jones reported, we were often within a ship's length of monitor. Once while passing we fired broadside at her only a few yards distant. She and her turret appeared to be under perfect control. The light draft enabled her to move about us at pleasure. Ironclad against ironclad, recalled monitor's chief engineer Stimmers. We maneuvered about the bay here and went at each other with mutual fierceness. They circled awkwardly, 
in what would appear to a modern observer as slow motion. Five times during the engagement, we touched each other, recalled Lieutenant Green, and each time I fired a gun at the Virginia and I will vouch the 168 pounds penetrated her sides. The shot, shell, grape, canister, musket, and rifle balls flew about us in every direction, but did us no damage. Our tower, the, the turret, was struck several times and through the noise was pretty loud. It did not affect us any. Inside the turret, two men leaned against the bulkhead just as the rebel shot whanged against the outside, knocking them senseless. Both recovered the following morning. They were the only injuries among the crew. Wrote Lieutenant Green, the effect upon one shut up in a revolving drum is perplexing. Both vessels were continuously turning, backing and forwarding while the turret spun independently. This was not your traditional man of war broadside gun deck. Green could see out only through the few inch gap between the gun muzzle and the top of the turret, a favorite target for Eagle Rebel muskets on Virginia. Through smoke, noise, concussion, and whirling of the turret, the lieutenant was disoriented and frequently blind. He could not see the enemy. A rebel projectile entering an open gun port would put them out of action. He could not see how his guns were pointed relative to his own vessel. A careless round striking the pilot house directly in front would end the fight. To make matters worse, the steam driven turret was slow to start and once moving, slow to stop, even slower to reverse. Like all monitors machinery, these mechanisms were undergoing their first combat trial. Green found it nearly impossible to stop rotation in line of fire, open the gun port, sight and shoot at a target that was itself moving. So he settled on a pattern. He would rotate the turret away from Virginia and stop the load, leaving the cumbersome gun ports open to save time and effort. Then when ready, start revolving again and fire both guns on the fly as the target swept past the muzzles. Green personally aimed and fired every round. To Virginia's Lieutenant John Taylor Wood, Monitor appeared but a pygmy. But in her size was one great element of her success. The Monitor was firing every seven or eight minutes and nearly every shot struck. When Monitor's turret revolved, we could see nothing but two immense guns, we called a rebel marine. Those guns bellowed and promptly disappeared while his gun crew struggled to respond. Lieutenant Jones wondered how the Yankees could take aim so quickly. But Virginia, however, was a large target, he wrote, and generally so near that the monitor's shot, shot, monitor's shot did not often miss. It did not appear to us that our shell had any effect upon the monitor. Jones maneuvered his lumbering vessel for nearly an hour, trying to ram and board monitor. But Warden turned away and suffered only a glancing blow. In the process, Monitor just missed Virginia's submerged stern, almost snapping off her rudder and propeller. As Monitor slid by, Virginia's after pivot gun delivered a 68 pound rifle shell against the pilot house from about 20 yards. Captain Warden's eyes were close behind the viewing slit. The explosion cracked and almost broke the iron box, flooding it with light. Paymaster Keeler stood below the platform, awaiting orders. A flash of light and a cloud of smoke filled the house, he wrote. I noticed the captain stagger and put his hands to his eyes. The blood was running from his face, which was blackened with powder smoke. My eyes, Warden said, I am blind, but do not mind me. Save the Minnesota if you can. Lieutenant Green came forward from the turret to assume command. The pilot and helmsman were shaken but not injured, while a stunned and partially blinded warden ordered the helm to starboard 
turning monitor away from the action into shallow water where Virginia could not follow and her guns could not reach. Seeing monitor withdraw, Minnesota's captain ordered every preparation to destroy his ship. But the rebel ironclad did not approach. Evening was descending, the tide was ebbing, Virginia was damaged and low on ammunition. Lieutenant Jones decided to retire with every confidence that, that the contest could be resumed the next day. Confederates would excoriate him for leaving Minnesota in enemy hands. Now in command of Monitor, Lieutenant Green longed to re-engage, but Virginia was retreating. He had to cover Minnesota. Another hit on the pilot house could be disabling and their wounded captain needed attention. So at about 12.15, Monitor let go a few last shots and turned away. Green also would be criticized for this decision by armchair admirals. Paymaster Keeler climbed through the iron hatch to a deck strewn with shell fragments. Virginia's parting shot shrieked over their heads and exploded about 100 feet away. Small steamers and boats from Newport News, Fort Monroe, and the various men of war surrounded them. Quote, all eager to learn the extent of our injuries and congratulate us on our victory. Thousands of spectators were astonished to learn that Monitor was uninjured and ready to resume the fight. Aboard the Minnesota, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Gustavus Fox had seen the whole fight. He hailed down to Monitor that they had fought the greatest naval battle on record and behaved as gallantly as men could wrote Lieutenant Green to his parents. I felt proud and happy then, mother, and felt fully repaid for all I had suffered. When told that Minnesota was saved, Warden said, then I can die happy. Future Admiral John Warden would recover most of the sight in his right eye, but his, pay, but his face was permanently blackened and his left eye destroyed. Monitor was struck 22 times, twice on the pilot house, nine on the turret and eight in the side armor and three on the deck. Lieutenant Green reported that his underclothes were black with smoke and powder. His nervous system was shot. Every bone ached, he could hardly stand. My nerves and muscles twitched as though electric shocks were continually passing through them and my head ached as if it would burst. Sometimes I thought my brain would come right out over my eyebrows. I lay down and tried to sleep. I might as well have tried to fly. Thank you. Ready for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dwight, that was excellent. That was absolutely wonderful. And I will tell you, we had the largest group I think we've ever had here uh, 71 we reached and um, that was an excellent presentation. I know we have some questions, so um, I will go ahead and uh, please keep yourself muted until you are asked the question, but let's go ahead and start with the one that um, um, Doug Snow Yenbos, um, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, I was uh, reading a book so many years ago, I can't remember, but um, they said the Monitor uh, crew uh, were worried about these 11-inch uh, Dahlgrens, and they didn't use the full charges that were recommended, and so, uh, and maybe it was because of the confined turret, which was kind of new, um, and so they were using two-thirds or three-quarter charges, and so, you know, their cannon ball struck the Virginia, but never penetrated. And the author seemed to think that if they had used the full charges, it probably would have been safe and they would have achieved some penetration of the Virginia's armor and armor belting. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yes, that, that's true. Um, the 11-inch the Dahlgren's a full charge of powder was 30 pounds, but, um, and they fired the guns a few times, uh, uh, in New York before they came down. Um, 
and but the Navy Department decided that it was too risky in that confined turret. Everybody was really pretty nervous about that because nobody had ever done that sort of thing before. And he, uh, the Navy Department, Wells uh, or Fox, uh, ordered ordered Warden to use only half charges, fifteen pounds. And so that's what he did. And yes, that's one of the one of the uh, big what ifs of the battle. Uh, the the Yankees uh, claimed afterwards that if they had used full charges, uh, they would have penetrated Virginia. And actually, the folks on the Virginia admitted that under certain circumstances, if they'd had two rounds in the same spot, for instance, or if they'd shot closer to the water line, there were circumstances where they might have penetrated. Um, after the battle, they did fully test the guns with full charges, and, and after that, they did use full charges. And actually, later, they ended up putting 15-inch uh, guns in some of the turrets, too. Uh, we have a question from Diane, but let me ask a couple of quick things so you can take down the slides, possibly. Um, your, your photo of the officers, could you identify uh, which were the officers in that uh, slide? And then also, I wanted to ask you, it looks as though the Virginia was very much like the Cairo. Um, the, the construction there. Uh, did the Cairo uh, model itself after uh, the Virginia? They were only superficially similar in the, in the sense that they were case, what they call casemated uh, ironclads, which means uh, simply an iron shed on top of a hull. Um, the Virginia was the first one, and of course the Confederates only built casemated ironclads. They didn't build any monitors, um, but they were not. Um, uh, the the uh, the Cairo is a is a by paddle wheel driven river monitor, uh, so it's it's its whole configuration would have been quite different. Uh, okay, Diane, do you want to ask your question? So, if France and England were foremost uh, innovators in this technology, what was the European reaction to the battle? Did it have an impact on European technology? Well, it, 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 it got their attention. I mean, uh, most professionals uh, were not surprised at the, at the trend of technology and, and the Europeans were moving ahead as fast in, um, in this development as they could. It probably focused them more on the turret uh, it, uh, design than, than, than they were before. Uh, but uh, they, they were moving ahead pretty rapidly anyway. And actually there was a, a British uh, engineer who had designed a, a turret uh, whose revolving mechanism and whose, whose base structure was different uh, and would actually end up being a better one than, than, uh, than Ericsson's design. Um, and kind of superseded it. So um, it, it got their attention in, in that they, they were impressed, but they weren't really surprised and, and they were headed in, those, in that direction anyway. Um, Carl, if you would, uh, um, let's see, there, there, I guess there's maybe the first question would be the question we have about uh, the demise of the uh, monitor. Okay, uh, yes. I, you know, uh, the monitor, um, after the battle, she was stationed in, in the Hampton Roads area for, for most of the summer. She did go up to Washington, D.C. to get some overhaul and some, in, some uh, uh, improvements, and then she came back down. And then that fall, she was assigned to go down south to join some other, uh, to, to join the fleet on her way south. She... Uh, ran into a severe storm and sunk off Cape Hatteras. Went down, lost, most of the crew was, was rescued, but uh, they lost several. Just uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so, she's been recovered and uh, parts of it, the turret has been recovered and the engines and some other parts. If you've, um, the, the uh, Newport News Maritime Museum and the Monitor Center it's just a great place to visit. If you're ever down there, it's a fantastic museum. And you actually see the turret in the, in the preservation tank 
uh, upside down and they have full full size mock-ups and just all sorts of great stuff. Carl uh, was the uh, person who asked about that. Carl, uh, do you have any follow-up questions? No, I, I understand that um, a number of years back, some of the remains of the crew of the monitor were um, laid to rest in Arlington Cemetery. I was wondering like, if, like uh, what we know about the, uh, like what you could share about the recovery of, of that and, and really how certain are we of the identity of those, those uh, members of the crew? Yes, actually, when they brought the turret up, and I, you know, I could dig up these for you, but when they brought the turret up, it was upside down because when the, when the ship sank, it flipped. And um, it was, of course, it was all full of, of mud and stuff, but the guns were still in it. And there were remains of, I think, two or three crewmen in the turret when they brought it back up. And those remains were um, preserved and uh, eventually um, uh, buried, as, as you said. And I think they actually did identify one or two of them. Yes. I. I think they identified the remains of an elderly sailor who apparently smoked a pipe for many years because he had a distinctive groove in his teeth. <laughs> and, and the other individual was a much younger man among two of the bodies which were in the turret. Uh, Burris, uh, you had a question too. Uh, I know you'll be speaking to us um soon and I'm looking forward to it, but you had a question about uh, the British Royal Navy. Actually, I just posted a, a comment about the, uh, the rea European reaction. Uh, the Royal Navy actually ado <coughs> adopted the monitor design for coastal defense. And in fact, they even had uh, monitors uh, uh, in the Royal Navy for coastal defense through World War II. One of them actually sailed across the English Channel and uh, Give support to a Royal Marine raiding party against German defenses on the coast of France. So they, the British did adopt the monitor for coastal defense purposes. Yes, they did build some monitors. Uh, John Anderson, uh, you have a question about the building of the ship in 100 days? Yes, I thought uh, 100 days was pretty, must have been a very incredible feat. And I even wonder if today we could even build half that ship in 100 days. Uh, <laughs> It's pretty amazing, um, especially with new technology going in and the idea of having to put it all together. It, it seems mind boggling, actually. Well, yes, it is. And, and, and actually, when you consider that we're, we're very used to contracting now, con contracting uh, you know, military construction out to uh, civilian firms, but that really wasn't the case before. Navy ships had always been built in Navy shipyards. But this was really the start of, of a uh, complex contracting effort. The design itself is, is, is amazing enough, but, but coordinating all those contractors and subcontractors and getting all the pieces together was a, was a pretty amazing effort at, uh, at management and coordination. Um, any other questions? Uh, Bill, I see you have your... No, I had a couple questions. Uh, one was, uh, was the new iron site available at that time for the Galnia, and why weren't they employed? Um, well, the new iron sides and the Galena uh, did have uh, careers. Uh, they, they weren't built by, by the time this battle took place. Um, the, the ironclad board was, was very concerned about getting seagoing ironclads that could counter uh, the, the French and the British ironclads. And so that's why the new Ironsides was designed primarily for that purpose. <clears throat> but it, it, uh, it would take a, a lot longer to build. So, and the Galena was similar to the new Ironsides, but smaller and had a, um, a kind of a unique way of, of using uh, horizontal strips of armor plating that didn't work too well. The new Ironsides actually had a pretty successful career in the blockading fleet and they were the blockading fleet, uh, supporting uh, the blockade efforts and, uh, and shore bombardment uh, tasks. And she was among the fleet uh, that uh, bombarded, um, sorry, I lost the name, the last fort they took down in- Fisher, I think you're talking. Yeah, Fisher. Fort, Fort Fisher, right. 
for Fort Fisher. So I am, the new Ironside had a fairly successful career, uh, and but the Galena was pretty much of a failure. She actually later in the summer of 1862, she and Monitor and a few of wooden gunboats went up the James to, to attack uh, the fort there on the river. Fire from the, from the, from the bluffs through the, the, the thin uh, armored deck of the Galena and really caused a lot of casualties and a lot of damage. <clears throat> Later on, they actually stripped the armor off Galena and kind of just made her a steam gunboat. Uh, so she wasn't too successful. <clears throat> Mick, you had a, a question too, if you could. Yes. Uh... Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Uh, how badly was the CSS Virginia damaged in this engagement? And if you could, what led to its, its scuttling or burning? Okay, well, that's, that's a good story too. Um, the Virginia was, was not badly damaged. Uh, all her top hamper, all of it uh, was blown off her boats and her david, uh, davits and and so on, um, and she had a couple of hits near a couple of gun ports, and uh, her stack was badly riddled, so she was getting a lot of smoke in the gun deck. And nothing really serious, uh, and she hadn't had her side gun, gun port lip covers put on anyway because she'd gotten underway so quickly. Uh, so uh, they, they were confident that they could get, fix her up and get her, get her back into action. And they actually did. I mean, she, she in the days following the battle, in the weeks following the battle, they kept bringing Virginia out and trying to get Monitor to re-engage with her. But uh, the Navy wasn't about to to risk Monitor, so they just kind of danced around in the, in the harbor and didn't do anything. Oh, and then uh, later that summer, Abraham Lincoln came down and he got real frustrated with the Navy and the Army because nothing was happening. So he talked them into uh, to, uh, conducting an amphibious landing uh, on the coast, uh, just outside in, in the Chesapeake, just outside of uh, Hampton Roads. And it's the only occasion that a sitting commander in chief directly uh, oversaw a, a military operation. The troops landed and they advanced toward Norfolk and they retook, retook Norfolk and the Gosport Navy Yard. And once they'd done that, the Virginia had no place to go. And so they had to scuttle her. And then so it wasn't scuttled because of damage. It was scuttled because it was trapped. It was trapped. That's right. It was, too, it, it was a, deep, uh, a deep water hole. They couldn't get her up to James. And um, they didn't. Uh, he, he thought they might try to get out to sea, but that wasn't practical either. He, they didn't have any choice. They had to scuttle and abandon her so she wouldn't be captured. Okay. What an ancillary question. Do you think the CSS Virginia could have been an ocean going threat rather than beyond coastal? Not, not, not uh, efficiently, no. Okay. She, she was too heavy well, with all the armor and uh, she was low in the water. Her engines were very inefficient and not and unreliable. The naval officers in charge of Virginia just knew she, uh, she was just, when she was designed and built, they knew she was just gonna be a harbor vessel. Okay, very good, thank you. Wade said his book is uh, in the process now and hopefully um, he can give us information about how to get his book and perhaps a signed one too. Um, yes, we happy to do that. Uh, yes, uh, Dwight. Uh, we know, of course, that there is a memorial in honor of Erickson in Washington, D.C., uh, off of Independence Avenue, close to the Lincoln Memorial. There are also memorials to Erickson uh, in Battery Park in New York City, and there is a, a fountain in his honor in Philadelphia, not too far from the... Uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. So my question to you is, if uh, you were going to describe to anyone, students or adults, uh, a little bit of information about Erickson, what would be the most significant things you would want to mention to them? Erickson was a, was a, was a brilliant engineer. In the, in the context of the times, he was self-educated. 
Of course, they didn't have the strict licensing and uh, requirements and so on that we have now. And his 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 talent was was uh, tinkering, kind of putting things together in, in in unique ways. And so he took a lot of elements like the turret and uh, the engines he developed that that were not revolutionary technology in themselves, but he put them together in a way that was unique. And that's 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 what made him a good engineer. He he did a lot of famous things. He. He, he, he developed early locomotives uh, and um, ref, ref, uh, refrigerators for you know for beer and, and lots of other things with steam technology. Uh, Paul Mazuka, if, uh, if you are ready to ask your question, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself there. I understand that twenty five percent of the Union Navy was Afri colored African American. How many members of the monitor? If if twenty five percent of the Union Navy was black. How many percent? What? How many uh, members of the oh. crew were black of the monitor? Well, I know that there were two or three, but I I, I don't know for sure. Um, of course, the Navy was far ahead of the Army in in the uh, enlistment of uh, of African Americans, um, and they they did it um, because they needed men, and the Navy, being a rather cosmopolitan force, was was used to having people of all all types and colors. So they, they were, you know, they, they, it wasn't nearly as controversial it was, as it was in the army. They were, they were happy to have them in, in, the, in the Navy in particular, like the blockading fleet where they were just desperate for men. They, they did enlist a lot of, of African-Americans, uh, both freedmen and escaped slaves. And uh, they, were, they were paid and treated just like any other sailor. And uh, they could even achieve petty officer rank, um, and and some and often did. Now, Martha Jewett has uh, uh, expressed uh, thank you, uh, not only for your program but also for your service. I'm sure everyone thinks the same and appreciates it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before I turn it Good. over to uh, John to uh, close out the program. Um, if you could explain again about how to get your book, I, I heard uh, Paul Mazuka has already ordered it from Savas. But if you could, uh, well, it'll, it, yeah, it'll be available on Amazon and uh, and from Savas Baby. And um, if you uh, if you'd like a signed copy, I'd be delighted to, to 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 get one for you. Keep in touch. My email is shipdriver at verizon.net. S H I P D R I V E R, just like it sounds, at Verizon.net. And uh, I'd be happy to sign a copy for you. Thank you, Dwight. Uh, John, did you have any questions? Or I did. I had a couple of comments and a question. Uh, first, comments uh, have to do with him, what, he's, what our speakers mentioned the emerging civil war and the, it, the, the group itself. I, have, I know Chris Makowski who is a founder and that Chris White was actually a speaker of ours when we were still live. And I would highly recommend that to everybody in, in this group. Uh, they even have a conference every year in Fredericksburg at Stevenson's Ridge. It was virtual this year, but it's gonna be the first weekend in August next year. Uh, by the way, I believe when you asked about the guy in the civilian clothes, it probably was the surgeon. His name was a, a guy named Daniel Loge, uh, who was, the, if you look him up, he was the ask, act, acting assistant surgeon, which means he was a contract surgeon, which means that he could very like, likely be wearing a civilian clothes there. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, thanks a lot for, for a great talk. Thank you for having me, and it's always a pleasure. Mm -hmm.